Now, as we come towards the end of the year, we want to have conversations with different personalities in the country. And today we have an opportunity to speak to the Prime Cabinet Secretary, but also the Cabinet Secretary in charge of uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Diaspora Affairs, uh, Moshmua Musalim Davadi. How are you doing? Very well. It's good to see you and to have this conversation. Thank you for the opportunity. But first, let's start by setting the stage because now you have two roles, the Prime Cabinet Secretary, but also the Cabinet Secretary for Foreign Affairs. So in your line of work, when are you a Prime Cabinet Secretary and when are you a Minister for Foreign Affairs? Um, well, they're intertwined. But first, uh, the function of the Prime Cabinet Secretary at this stage is primarily to assist the President and the Deputy President in the coordination and supervision of government programs, policies and projects. So it is a coordinating role. And in the coordinating role, remember there's the parliamentary department, parliamentary and legislative affairs department, where again, uh, the office of the Prime Cabinet Secretary is supposed to coordinate um, uh, the legislative agenda of all government departments yes. uh, in conjunction with the Attorney General and the respective ministries. But in practical terms, coordinating um, government, what exactly does that entail? What do you do? Well, you see, first of all, a government has got several departments. And uh, coordination means coherence, sharing information, making sure that there is a concerted effort to have what you'd call uh, a coordinated approach mm -hmm. to various challenges so that people are not working in isolation uh, or working in silos. So coordination becomes absolutely critical so that uh, we, we want to achieve a situation where the left hand knows and understands what the right hand is doing and why. Mm -hmm. Okay, So this becomes the, the issue when we are talking about coordination. coordination. So, so how do you do that? Is it through the cabinet secretaries? Is it through the principal secretaries? Um, I want to understand it from the practical side. At, at both levels, actually, at yeah. both levels. Uh, in, this, in, in, in the office of the PCS, there's the national uh, according to the executive order number two, there's the National uh, Government Coordinating Secretariat, Coordination Secretariat. Now, within this framework, uh, then we are able to interact with all the departments of, of government and all ministries. So at some level, you talk to the cabinet secretaries, uh, but the primary instrument of uh, coordinating is really the entity that you call the NDIC. This is the committee of PSS, which I chair. Okay. Now, it's at that level that, uh, because the PSS are really the technical arm of the ministries, right. then we engage more robustly uh, with them. How often does that happen? Uh, quarterly. Quarterly, yes. every three months? Yes, every three months, because you, you want them to work. So you're able to have, give them some lead time so that you can have a, a, a good moment to review how the performance has been within each quarter. So you assist, according to the executive order, mm -hmm. uh, number one, but also number two of 2023, you assist the president and the deputy. Mm -hmm. That sounds like the role of a prime minister. Well, uh, the title they have given this office is prime cabinet secretary. But I do agree with you, there's a, there's a very serious debate uh, uh, and I think it's now in the public domain mm -hmm. that uh, even within the conversation that was taking place at Bomas, uh, the, the, the feeling is that you might as well uh, <coughs> uh, refer to this office as the Prime Minister's office. Mm -hmm. um, when we go regionally, uh, the terminology Prime Cabinet Secretary uh, sounds different. Right. Uh, and uh, whether you're looking at Uganda or you're looking at Tanzania, for instance, and even many other countries. So they tend to say, why don't you just simplify the nomenclature and refer to it as uh, the, the prime, prime minister. minister's office. But there has been conversations mm -hmm. that this is actually introducing the office of the prime minister through an illegal route. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the National Dialogue Committee report, mm -hmm. 
essentially they are talking about entrenching it in the con into the constitution. Mm -hmm. Is there some irregularity here or an illegality committed? No, no, no illegality was committed uh, because as it stands, I'm a cabinet uh, <coughs> secretary and uh, the president can then assign you different roles. Uh, and I went through the process of vetting uh, in parliament. So we crossed that bridge uh, way back. If national dialogue and it's both sides of the divide that are coming out to agree that it needs to be entrenched into the constitution. Is it an admission that there's some irregularity there? No, it's not necessarily an admission that there's an irregularity. There's no irregularity. I think uh, we, it's, it's, uh, society has got to be dynamic. Um, and as we go into the future, okay, there's the whole debate about inclusivity of uh, Kenyans and regions in terms of the leadership of a nation. Yes. All right. So the debate that uh, is still alive and continues is that uh, do we feel or do Kenyans feel that the executive is too narrow? All right. Uh, and therefore the debate has been uh, why not uh, introduce and formalize okay, the whole aspect of uh, the office of a prime minister. Okay. okay. Now it's it's the same principle. Now also plays out in the question of the opposition. Right. That is why now there's a debate that uh, uh, and recommendations are quite clear. Nobody is really against it. That uh, perhaps Kenyans made a mistake mm -hmm. in actually uh, trying to do away with the, the office of the leader of opposition. And now that debate is back with us. This is interesting because I remember not so long ago, mm -hmm. there was the Building Bridges Initiative that you actually appended your signature in support. Mm -hmm. Then it appears quite consistent in terms of establishment of those offices. Mm -hmm. But there has also been concerns about your relationship with uh, the presidency, specifically with the deputy president, Tugadi Gashagwa, a perception that you two might be competing. At the start of President William Ruto's term, there's a time that uh, a lot of responsibilities were heaped on you, especially on representing the president outside the, of this country. How do you respond to that for people that feel there's actually some bit of hostility? First of all, I'll, I'll take to two issues. The first one you refer to the BBI. Okay. Uh, the BBI process was mishandled. You know, uh, let, let's agree to that. Uh, because it keeps on coming back and it comes back in a simplistic perspective that oh but this was there and this was there but there are some things in the BBI that we told them that they would uh, create headwinds for instance you remember in the BBI there was an attempt okay to stifle the independence of the judiciary right okay we keep on forgetting that that was embedded there You'll remember there was an attempt to try and get rid of the structures around the security network mm -hmm. so that you do away with the police service commission, you do away with certain things, and then you vest that in a minister. Mm -hmm. uh, why are Kenyans forgetting that those are the examples of the things wrong. that were wrong right. in the BBI? Mm -hmm. All right? The principle about the broad changes and in whatever, maybe it was not an, uh, uh, the, but there was very specific issues that were obnoxious. Now, the other one, it's really, uh, for me, it is uh, uh, trying to create something where there's none, trying to create a conflict where there's none. We are barely one year in office. The executive order is very specific that my role is to assist the president and the deputy president and uh, some I've been in public space for a very long time in terms of my experience okay so I know what the role of a deputy president is I know what the role of a president is and I know how to manage uh, my role as the prime cabinet secretary so the issue of there was conflict or there was competition 
is neither here nor but, there. But you've, you've heard of the speculation? Yes, but, and I've ignored it. Okay. I'm responding to it for the first time through you. Right. But as far as I'm concerned, it was a non-issue. It doesn't exist. So how do you take instructions um, to assist the president or the deputy? Where do you uh, get those instructions from? Well, the, sometimes the instructions can be verbal, sometimes they can be written. From, from who? Uh, the president. How if, 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 if the president wants to give me direction, he can call and say, I want you to do uh, a certain thing for me. Have you received instructions from the deputy president to assist? Of course. Of course, he has. He has asked me to handle certain meetings on his behalf or to get certain engagements carried out on his behalf. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And moving on to, obviously, at a time that you are transitioning to now holding the position of Prime Cabinet Secretary and uh, CS for Foreign Affairs and Diaspora Affairs, there was a bit of miscommunication, or was it a tiff, I don't know what you call it, uh, between yourself and the, tri I mean, the Public Service Minister now, uh, Moses Kuria. What was that about? Uh, actually, I don't know. You didn't see the communication that came from your office, your official, former official, Kibisu Kabachesi? That I saw later, but it's neither here nor there now. It's behind us. Uh, so there was no tiff. CS Kuria responded to the media and said that um, he had been assigned. Of course, we saw the publication, uh, the statement from the chief of staff, that his office was to be domiciled here, uh, that you speak from. But then he said you requested to stay here. I don't know how much of that is accurate, but also the reasoning behind it. Well, you know, the station or the position of an office or where it is domiciled or headquarters is communicated through a gazette notice. An executive order is a gazette notice signed off by the president. Okay, it's an elevated gazette notice. That is why it's called an executive order. Now, when this debate was raging, uh, Sam, was there a gazettement? There was no communication there from was the no. chief of staff. So you respond to the executive order, and the executive order clarified, and now you have it with you, and the position is clear. So it's no longer an issue. So it came way later. The reason I'm asking this, because you are state officer, so is CS Courier, and also I believe the chief of uh, staff. But let me ask you, Sam, of yeah. what value is that question? What I'm asking is, uh, what exactly was happening, because this is one government. It came out as if there's a fight, but you're saying there no, was not. there was not. Yeah, that's why I'm telling you, of what value is it? The CS said that you requested to stay here, and the question is, no. Traditionally, just a moment. Uh -huh. Traditionally, the Office of Foreign Affairs has always been at the old treasury. Now, the Office of the PCS was here. So I'm just wondering, why was it not possible in the first communication to have either the office move here, the Office of the Foreign Affairs, or have the Office of PCS move to Foreign Affairs? You see, you're forgetting that first and foremost, I'm um, PCS. Right. The Office of the PCS is here, all right? Right. The, at that time, the domicile of foreign affairs was on the other. So he was not taking over the role of PCS, was he? So can we then close that debate? I want to close it, but yeah. uh, shortly after, when the executive order came mm -hmm. out, mm -hmm. um, the roles, uh, that is the one on uh, state corporations, inspectorate and state corporations advisory committee, they had been under your office, but now they were to move, or the CS said they were to move to the public service because they had that role of uh, coordinating no, a few that things. Is, that is why I'm telling you you are wrong. We were waiting for the executive order. All right? When the executive order came out, where did those roles go? They went to the presidency. Absolutely. To the office of the president. Yeah, absolutely. So, what I'm trying to say is that you don't jump the gun. When there's a communication of that nature, what you do is you wait for the executive order so that it brings clarity to the issues. And that is what we were doing. So the statement by the chief of staff should have been ignored, or what? He made a statement. He said that changes have been made. 
But equally, there's correspondence where he said, further clarification is to follow. Okay, but that did not necessarily come out in the media, but it's there. Interesting. So, how do you maintain the office of Prime Cabinet Secretary and CS Foreign Affairs here, while some of your staff are still at the old treasury? Do you have an office there, first of all? Let me tell you, yeah. many government departments have a shortage of space. Even when Foreign Affairs uh, Minister was sitting there, there's a whole department at Upper Hill. Yes, Prophets. Isn't it? Right. What, what is the building called? 360? Uh, 360 degrees, I think. Up. 316. Mm -hmm. Is there still the Office of Cabinet Secretary Foreign Affairs at the old Treasury building? Yes, there's an office there. And people are using it. The building is full. Have you been there? No, I'm asking, a speci is there uh, an, a yes, specific office a, for the yes, CS Foreign Affairs? Yes, there's an office there. And I can have some meetings there. There's absolutely nothing wrong in me having some meetings there. And but this a, is where I sit. And with a shortage of offices, don't you think it would be By prudent way, to... Don't you know we are accommodating people here? In foreign affairs. There are also others who could not get space there and they are here. That's what I'm asking. In the spirit of austerity measures, why have an office here but another office in a different because building? Because when you have over 1,400 people, Mr. Sam Gituku, they will not fit in one place. I think we're not understanding each other. I'm talking about the uh, you, Office you, of you, Cabinet Secretary. You're talking of austerity measures. Yes. And I'm trying to tell you, already, we are squeezed with space. Right now, as we sit here, we are accommodating the inspectorate. Mm. We are accommodating GDS in this mm -hmm. building. GDS, uh, you mean government delivery, delivery services? Delivery services. Okay. I was being accommodated in treasury mm -hmm. on the 10th floor mm -hmm. because there's a shortage of space. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's a plan for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to have a completely new building put up so that it can take care of its officers. Okay. Do, do you have you identified where that would be? The, it's being worked on. When to the, construct when or to buy? To construct. Okay. Yeah. Let's get to the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs mm -hmm. as a docket. First of all, why did the President pick on you? I suppose it's the experience uh -huh. uh, that uh, I carry on my shoulders. Um, I've been in the public space for some time. Uh, and uh, he had confidence that my engagement would add value to Kenya's uh, diplomatic uh, agenda. Why, why do you think it was ne necessary to do the reshuffle and change uh, in that docket? The president can do a reshuffle at any one time. Okay. Let us, uh, because if you are to ask why was it necessary to do the reshuffle, that is a question that the president should answer. Not but, me. But, but you would know because he would give you specific no, instructions no, no, no. on what he but, wants to handle. But uh, I, I told you one thing earlier that I've been in public space for some time. Yeah. All right. So you know when to speak what. Okay. Mm -hmm. And how you speak to certain things. Perhaps that is why I'm sitting here as the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Right. Other than being the PCS. Because the message I'm trying to tell you is this that the President will from time to time make decisions and reorganize his government as he deems fit. All right? And if he consults, it is his prerogative to consult. Okay? But we must now also get out of this notion that if you have consulted with the president, you rush out and you tell people, I have consulted with the president. There are some things that you consult, and you consult in confidence. You, you, you're, you're saying something interesting. Yes, I am. Um, so that, that was a problem before you came in? Uh, what was a problem? Consulting and speaking out. No, co consulting and sp in confidence is important. Yeah? And there are issues. This is why we are diplomats. This is why you're in public space. There are aspects that you consult 
and there are those that will be consumed at different levels yeah. or communicated at different times. So that is the whole essence of being in public space. Right. Yeah. You still don't answer my question. Mm. Um, why it was necessary? You say the president has the prerogative. Indeed he has. But from what you've seen, for the time you've been at the ministry, um, what would you say are the areas that you needed to fix as a matter of urgency as you start your tenure as CS Foreign Affairs? As I said, the president thought, in my view, that uh, I would add value to his diplomatic engagements. Let's, let's take, for instance, he's pursuing an aggressive agenda mm -hmm. on economic diplomacy. That is one thing he's pursuing. Issues of how do we get more foreign direct investment, how do we step up our investments and so forth. Now, obviously, my background at the Treasury lends a lot of weight to the agenda that he wants to pursue. So that is an example I can give you. Okay. Interesting. So a few weeks ago, or no, actually, by the time the reshuffle was happening, uh, there was uh, the list of high commissioners and ambassadors that uh, were nominated by the president, now appointed. Um, what is now the new direction? Because when you looked at that list, a few of those nominees are... Uh, Career, career persons, others are political leaders. What is changing in terms of these deployments and what is the agenda foreign policy for Kenya? I think what is important is that uh, there's no harm in blending public appointments. Um, when we look at aspects of diplomacy or even when we look at how government needs to infuse new thinking and new approaches, you have to have a blend you have the career uh, uh, diplomats, and then there's no harm in, f in infusing uh, some different kind of approach and thinking mm -hmm. into our diplomacy by engaging people who may have political experience or may have business experience to come and be part of uh, the team. Now, it's a question of what should be the ratio. Now, that is debatable. Would it be a 50-50 ratio of career diplomats and those who uh, are coming in from different sectors of uh, uh, the country, or would it be a 60-40 uh, ratio? So that becomes a debatable issue, mm -hmm. okay? But I think the infusion is necessary, and it is important that if you want to have uh, a country that is moving forward, uh, a civil service that is dynamic and so forth, you must respect the career people but you must also make sure that it does not become incestuous. Okay. You must infuse some new thinking into these processes. And that comes in by allowing uh, other Kenyans to participate. And that was the first nomination and appointment of ambassadors and high commissioners by the current president. Is that it or more coming? Because you still have a lot of ambassadors have, and high commissioners. We have, we, have, we have engagements in many countries. So we must anticipate that uh, changes will, because you, um, some of them uh, have their terms still running. Okay, so it's transition. Yeah, you don't guillotine in, in certain circumstances. You don't just guillotine. By the way, the other day I was talking to, I was at the, uh, the Judiciary uh, Forum when they were launching their annual report on the stage and I say, uh, the, the, the strategic uh, uh, document of engagement, access to justice. And I s raised one issue, that when a government is changing, we go to Kasarani. When we go to Kasarani, we actually go there because it's the ceremony contemplated in the Constitution, okay? And there's an act, a very thin act, which they say assumption to office, to office yes. act. Mm. But when you look at that act, it is concentrated on the ceremony. Now, 
as we look at the government agenda, what is our experience? Our experience is that there is no transition of executive authority law. There's a vacuum. So you think we need that law? Yes, we need to. Because at what stage does a minister cease to hold office? Cease to hold office. Have you prescribed what he should do as he exits? Does he prepare any handover notes? Does he uh, give a list of um, a schedule of the assets, an inventory of the assets, the critical assets of the ministry? All these things are blank. And that is interesting because... And um, the, same, the same holds for the principal secretaries. Right. All right. So this is why I'm saying transition is not about a guillotine. We need to be very careful and organize in the way we manage this. Let me give you an example, another example. That's why this thing is, a se is more serious than you imagine. We went to the elections. The law says that the chairman of the electoral commission shall gazette or sign off for gazettement the results and the winner of that election. Some, you'll be shocked to know that after Chebukati gazetted President William Ruto as the winner, somebody within the government printer was hesitating to gazette those results. The argument being that he was waiting for orders from above. From who? That's the question. That's the question. If the law is clear, then why would somebody who is supposed to gazette the results be seeking consent from another source? And yet, it is so clear that the chair of the Electoral Commission, Commission has gazetted. Who clears that? Now, these are the issues that we say under the transition of executive authority, we must bring clarity. Did you notice, out of surprise, uh, that there were gazette notices coming out, appointing people, way after the president had been thrown in. Did you ever look at that? What appointments? Public appointments. To what offices? Yes. What offices? Public office. Give me an example. Parastatals. Like what parastatals? Oh, just go back to that. Go back and you'll see the Gazette notices. When was the president thrown in? 13th September 2022. Yes. You find Gazette notices appointing people uh, at the end of September and in October. And what was the explanation? That is the question. So, the transition of executive authority bill must be able to have clarity and bring order to this kind of thing. You, you know, PCS, you raised that issue at a time that there has been conversation about um, shifting of the authority of the or the, the working of the government printer, and I don't know how much is true uh, that it has moved to State House. What's going on? The government printer's uh, role has always been in the office of the president. Yeah, so to me that has not shifted. He's still at, under that office? Yes, you, you check the history. So, so, the, so the government printer is always within the office of the president. So do they take instructions from anyone in terms of, of practice? Of, of course, in, in terms of practice, the law guides the gazettement. So if the law says uh, so-and-so should gazette, it's that person who should gazette. His, by, the gazette should reflect the signature of that person. It doesn't require the government printer to apply their mind, the gazette or they receive? No, no, the government printer should not vary. She cannot vary. Okay. The, the, the instructions. Uh, the instructions. Okay. On the question of uh, nominations and appointments to various missions, what is your thinking about if you are to move an ambassador from one station to another, 
being done by a new president? Do they just move or do they need to be vetted? Uh, if he has gone through the vetting and he's a serving ambassador, uh, he has done his bit, he's already been vetted. Okay, so if the president is extending... Uh, no, in this case you have a new president. Yes. But like you he, have today. Yes, but if he feels, in, okay, it may, may sound a gray area, but if he feels that a sitting ambassador who has already gone through the vetting is qualified and competent to handle another station, that is the lateral transfer, I don't think he's, he's in breach of the law. Don't you think that's a, an inconsistency? Because previously there's actually a, 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 a high court decision by saying that Prime Cabinet Secretary is, sorry, Cabinet Secretary is transitioning even if it's from the first term to the second term of the same president, every appointment must come with vetting. In fact, your colleague in cabinet, Simon Chelugui, was a cabinet secretary. He was appointed and vetted afresh. Shouldn't the same apply to serving ambassadors who are being appointed by a new president? It's, uh, I say it's a gray area because, you see, with the cabinet uh, level, it's at a different uh, status, okay? With what does that, that mean? Uh, it, is, it is at a different level, okay? Uh, because the cabinet is the highest uh, organ, okay? And it is normally deemed okay, that when a new president takes over, cabinet ceases. That cabinet ceases. Mm -hmm. But ambassadors do not cease. And PSS do not cease. There is, there is a transition. Question. Yeah. PS Hinga had been serving as PS in President Kenyatta's government. Come President Ruto, he's appointed to a different, actually the same department. He was vetted. Don't you think he should apply to all appointments by the president that require but, vetting? But, 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 you see, that's what I'm saying. It may be a gray area. Okay? It may be a gray area. But in the case of the diplomats, the way I look at it, this particular diplomat may not have been vetted because he has already gone through the process and therefore an assignment okay. to another station does not call for him to be, to be back. But when you're looking at the ministries, the ministers tend to reorg the president tends to reorganize the ministries. He doesn't call them by the same name. Very rare. That's interesting, but as you said, there's a gray area there. Now, in that Gazette notice, the executive order that came uh, moving you, no, it wasn't a Gazette notice, it was communication uh, moving you or rather adding new roles as uh, Foreign Affairs CS, there is um, a department or rather a mission that received an appointment for an ambassador, Hargeisa. But clarification came later that it's actually a liaison office. What is the position of the Kenyan government on the place of Somaliland? First of all, Somalia is taking up a very good, uh, a very good direction. Uh, let me put it that way. And uh, we want that country to be stable. There are challenges that still remain. Uh, different factions or different clan-related uh, issues that still affect uh, parts of Somalia. But I'll give you an indication, perhaps the strongest signal ever, that uh, normalcy is beginning to return to Somalia is the fact that just a few weeks back, or a few days ago, um, the East African community has more or less given the green light now for Somalia to become a member of uh, the East African community. That is a huge statement uh, that we are looking at. And that means that the East African community is recognizing the government that is in place. I think that is really what I can tell you about that. Did it cause a diplomatic challenge? No. When we, there was said to be a high commissioner, is it an ambassador to Hargeisa? No, 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 you see sometimes communication uh, can, can uh, perhaps be, can slip through our fingers. Okay. But as far as I'm concerned, we recognize one government in, 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 in Somalia, and that's the government that uh, we are looking forward to joining the East African uh, community. 
There's another co uh, confusion, uh, Waziri, about um, the place of uh, Sahrawi Arab Rep Republic. Um, and immediately, President Ruto was sworn in. In fact, there was representation from Sahrawi Republic itself. Then after that, he said that um, Kenya is no longer recognizing that. Eventually, it was changed by the then principal secretary at that time. You know, the, the Sahrawi thing is, uh, remember it was passed within the African Union? Yes. Okay. Uh, but there also are challenges uh, with the, some of the African Union countries uh, that still remain uh, unresolved mm -hmm. or unsettled. Uh, and therefore, um, while we respect the African Union position, uh, I think it is only prudent uh, that we manage this issue carefully because uh, the concerns also fall within other uh, member countries of the AU. S and uh, that is where the matter should rest for now. So, so what is the gov government's position, the government of Kenya, on the place of Sahrawi I think, I think right now, let us uh, make it very clear that we just, we respect the African Union position, but there are challenges that affect other member countries and those uh, will take some time to resolve. So the African Union position is to recognize that region, isn't yes, it? Yes, that, that, that uh, was taken. Okay, so the principal secretary at that time um, said, he released communication saying that um, it should equally be noted that Kenya does not conduct its foreign policy on Twitter or any other social media platforms, but rather through official government documents and frameworks. That was Masharia Kamau. And he was saying this upon the communication that was released by the new president at that time, William Ruto. How much of communication is still going on on Twitter? And does this represent the position of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs? And, uh, I think that's an unfair communication, uh, an unfair question to say how much, how much would I know that is communication going on through Twitter? That is a debatable issue, my friend, uh, because people may tweet differently. But uh, as we speak now, we in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs will communicate uh, officially on matters as sensitive as that uh, if and the situation demands that we, we make communication. Where official channels so, yes, we will communicate. is what? Oh, proper statement, a proper communication, communique comes out. I ask that because, I mean, the officers of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs have over time been, been saying several interesting things or controversial things on the social media, talking about the former PS, the current PS, sometimes even contradicting uh, serving cabinet secretaries. What is that? Well, those are personal opinions. I think those are personal issues. That's why I'm saying that that is not the official communication, is it? Those are personal issues. If people are communicating uh, uh, their concerns and their issues on Twitter, please do not mistake that as official government communication. But does it bother you as the minister in charge of foreign affairs? Of course it does, but we can only talk to it and once we communicate better and people get to understand the established communication channels, then it will we'll be able to overcome some of these challenges. And when the same officers are saying different things and public, the public is responding to them, including your own um, friends in the international scene, how do you deal with that? Especially when it goes against, for instance, the Sahrawi issue. If, if there is an issue for clarification, yeah, we are available to clarify. I think that's the best thing I can tell you. Okay, all right. So I want us to talk mm -hmm. about um, the foreign policy of the country. Um, there has been this debate: Are we still facing East? Is it West, or is it after our interests? What is it, as you know it? We are engaging all countries. All these countries have missions here. All these countries have missions here and we have engagements with them. We have joint co uh, economic cooperation agreements with them and MOUs with them. All these countries help us in different sectors. They have different interests. So we engage all of them. Yeah. And so, so we're not leaning either west or east. Is that what you're saying? We are working robustly with all our partners. When you look at... Um, the visits that the president has made, several of them to Western nations, if you're talking about the Americas or the US, uh, if you're talking about uh, uh, Europe, 
that is UK, France, Germany, there are quite a number. Uh, France, Germany, and um, UK, you're talking about some seven visits at least. The US, uh, two or three or thereabout, and some of them have been, uh, you can see the magnitude. We're not facing east, I mean facing west. Uh, you're forgetting that he has been to China? Once. Are you sure? Yes. Uh, are you forgetting that uh, uh, we are going to go to, uh, I told you earlier, that we are heading India. to India? You will, you haven't. Uh, yes. Yeah. Was it a, you, you know this better than uh, many how do you regard Kenyans. How do you regard Japan, who is a, and a strong partner of ours? How many times has he visited? He's going to visit, I can tell you that. Japan, for instance, is perhaps our largest bilateral partner. Do you see a do, shift? Do, he was in Korea. You forgot that his first trip was to Korea. Yes, he was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The other day, he has made quite a number of visits to Saudi in the Middle East. And he's made several trips to African countries. He wants a strong partnership across the board. We've where, seen where, there's, where there's an investment opportunity in infrastructure and it's coming strongly from China, it's coming from Japan, we will engage. If there's a business opportunity by the private sector, like the United States have shown that they want to have uh, the largest manufacturing plant here, Moderna, we will engage. If the UK says that they want to assist us so that we can uh, rehabilitate our railway system and have uh, a modernization and rehabilitation of our railway system, we will engage. And now, if India wants to support us in agriculture, maybe cotton, rice, and what of you, we will engage. I'm asking that because for yes. the very first time, yes. we have seen a US ambassador marketing Kenya probably more than any Kenyan ambassador has. So aggressively, I'm talking about Ambassador Meg Whitman. And has been, she's, she's been doing that both in the country, but also in the US when the president was there, uh, to an extent of even talking about, if I may quote here, that uh, the reason why she's doing that is because Kenya is the most stable democracy in East Africa. Kenya is the gateway to the East African market of nearly 500 uh, consumers. Kenya is the regional logistics hub, leading finance hub, uh, leading destination for foreign uh, direct investments and venture capital, Silicon Savannah with super smart engineers and a dedicated and entrepreneur uh, neuro workforce. I mean, that's quite aggressive for a Western ambassador. Don't you think you should be proud of it as a Kenyan? Even, I want, to, I want to be proud, but I want to understand no, the government no, no, no. position uh, in did, terms did you, of shifting it, policy. You're a, man, you're a man with a very good understanding, and I think you should be proud that an American ambassador or an ambassador of such a nation can give such credit to your country, to our country. I think it's a very important statement. And I think we should celebrate the fact that we are being seen in that light by our, our, our friends. Do you think it is the place of a foreign ambassador in a country to be endorsing a government of what she thinks? Yes, she can say what she thinks and she's entitled to say what she thinks, all right? When they talk about uh, Kenya has a robust democracy, don't you think it's true? The reason why I'm asking that question is the statement that she gave, um, endorsing an election that you'd find there's a political divide that still feels that's not the case. I think the process was, went through. We had an election. The people who had concerns went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court made a ruling, unanimous ruling, that the process was okay and the victor is rightfully in office. When are we going to get out of the hangover mm -hmm. that that election is behind us? Okay, so if your ambassador did that in a foreign country... There's absolutely nothing wrong. You'd have no problem with that? No. Let's talk about um, the visits that the president has made. 
and of course he's gone to the UK two times. First, the funeral of uh, the late uh, Queen of uh, England, the second time coronation of uh, the current King, and in that, actually the King came uh, to the country. What was going on behind the scenes that we didn't see, and what is this geared to in, in as far as the positioning of Kenya in the global space? You know, when the King visited here, we also had official engagements on matters development with the then Secretary uh, of Foreign Affairs and Commonwealth Matters, cleverly. He was here. We had a separate meeting. We talked of the railway city. We talked about uh, investments in the Grand High Falls Dam. We talked about uh, aspects relating to uh, energy, mm -hmm. etc. Uh, we talked about investments of private companies consolidating their, their, their place here. Now, the official visit of the king as a state visit is one. He is the head of state there. Now, on the other side, we talked and engaged about the development bilateral issues that relate to the two of us. So it was not just about the king alone. Okay? The king came in, and his entourage, included in his entourage, was the minister responsible for international cooperation. Yeah. And, and PCS, during that time of the visit, there had been a lot of voices, people talking about the reparations for the Mau Mau contest about uh, what may have happened over the years, 60 years later. But you didn't hear the voice of the government. What does the government think about those voices? The government is uh, very serious about those voices. Uh, the structure of that meeting, as it was, was that the king wanted to engage uh, separately, on his own with uh, some of the individuals who may have been directly affected on some issues. So the whole idea was that he wanted that moment of exclusivity of conversing with them. Not a situation where the government is seen to be the one driving that conversation. Okay, so I just wanted you to take note of that. However, a few days ago, I was in Ghana representing the president of Kenya on the AU-initiated process of the reparations from past colonial uh, uh, governments and atrocities. Mm -hmm. This was now chaired by Akufo Ado of President, uh, President of Ghana. Now, I was there to represent uh, the government of Kenya in the conversation of having a unified approach and strategy under the umbrella of AU on matters reparation. Right. Okay. And this brings not just Africa, but it also brings the African in the diaspora, the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so th there was no direct discussion on this with the king or the no, government of UK. Uh, no, no. That one. Okay. That one did not take place. Okay. Uh, I want to talk about um, the region, the East African region, and recently there has been uh, contestation from the government of Uganda, specifically on the trade through Kenya, specifically on the question of oil, and they are not happy. Uh, in fact, the president said that, um, they are, uh, that uh, they are no longer going to engage with brokers uh, for their oil. What is going on here? I think there are issues that will be sorted out. Um, it, there could be some supply chain uh, issues that uh, have come into play because of uh, the, the G2G arrangement. But these are being addressed uh, and uh, I am sure that we shall be able to uh, handle the concerns that are, are there. Uganda and the region is a very key player is one of our largest uh, trading partners. And from time to time, uh, there will always be issues uh, about our trading relationship and uh, from one commodity to the other. Mm -hmm. You will remember there were issues on uh, 
on milk uh, at one time. Yes. There were issues on uh, uh, eggs at, at some time. There were issues around sugar. But with time, these are then uh, uh, resolved. Has there been direct engagement with the government of Uganda on those, we especially have, the question of oil? We have, we have uh, the, the key departments uh, working through that to figure out what are the issues. We have the Ministry of Energy, and I would want uh, to, to allow them to continue the process of engagement. And uh, we shall be able but, to. But PCS, you have coordination roles. I, I thought yes, you have an idea. Yes, yes, but um, but when people are having a conversation, yeah, it, it doesn't mean that my coordination role must be that uh, I'll just snap my fingers and say that that has been sorted out. That has been sorted out. I'm trying to tell you that there's a process which involves conversation. Please indulge me because I want us to quickly speak about uh, what's happening locally in the country mm. and. Um, you're a politician. I would imagine that beyond this, you also have ambitions. Don't you think the role of um, CS foreign affairs, diaspora affairs, is sort of taking you away from your political base? When is the election? I know it is in 2027, but uh, don't you, know, you think? You know, no, I, I think I want to put a closure to certain things. Mm -hmm. I came in very clearly that we want to support President Ruto. Mm. And I have every reason uh, to believe that President Ruto intends to defend his position in 2027. Right. And I have made a decision that I will back him in his second attempt. Therefore, the whole issue of this other debate, uh, as far as Honorable Musalia Modavadi is concerned, should be put to closure. What is important now is, can we resuscitate the economy? And I am on record as saying that the dilemma we were put in and the dilemma we found ourselves in is such that it will take a painful two to three years before we start seeing real adjustments. T talk to me about the National Dialogue Committee is recommending that uh, as part of dealing with the cost of living, um, the government should cut travel budget by 50% and also the daily subsistence, subsistence allowances should be reduced by 30% by the SRC. How viable is this at a time that um, you've been on aggressive, an aggressive campaign to really market the country, and that requires travel? It, it may require travel, but uh, uh, you just then work uh, around the suggestions. If Parliament endorses that, that uh, report and uh, uh, it's supported, uh, then it's part of the austerity measures, and we would have to live with it. We would just have to use technology as well to enhance the aspects of, of uh, the diplomacy. But of course, nothing can replace people-to-people -people contact. Okay, so, so for now you have not f looked at the cost of travel and how that can be reduced? We have, we have, we have. There are areas of, we've, by the way, delegations have been reduced drastically when we're going out to, to, to the people are going very, very lean in number. Okay. Yeah. All right, so you're speaking about uh, we have to improve the economy, or the government has to improve the economy, of course, with the people uh, before the next election. But that has, that has not been what people are feeling. In fact, today, I, I, I'm sure you interact with people and they'll tell you how difficult life has become because of the taxation questions, the cost of living itself. Apart from Unga, whose price has quite reduced, many other things are up. Yes, it's true. It's, it's, it's painful. I mean, uh, I've, I've, uh, on that one, I agree with you that uh, I said it's going to take us about two to three years of of uh, a bit of uh, pain and the difficult times. I said it from the word go. But Sam, if you'll remember, and I think you interviewed me on this, as far back as about 2015, 2016, I think in one of your interviews, we talked about this thing. If we go back to those clips, you will recall that I forewarned that the level of borrowing 
that the government was indulging in was going to haunt us. I don't know whether you recall. Yes, I do. Yes, hasn't it come to pass? And so what is the solution? Because so the solution is yeah. that we are trying to, um, to, 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 to correct a very serious situation. And I'll want to give you an example. For us to move ahead, we have to engage with the IMF. And we have to engage with the World Bank. And we have to engage with our development partners. Because there's no way we can raise all that money at the moment from our local resources. So it has to be a mix of the two. People are shouting, but just contemplate a Kenya without IMF support at this point in time. Just contemplate a Kenya without World Bank support at this point in time. If they think this is bad, we would be in fire. How does fire look like? The fire? Oh, the fire looks like uh, when all your aid is cut off. You can imagine that. Your programs grind to a halt. You can not pay your debts. Your assets are being impounded in different countries. That is how bad it can get. You can imagine if Kenya Airways flew somewhere and the planes are being impounded in those countries. So this, this is the magnitude of what we are going through is very serious. And I give you this example because I was also previously a minister for finance. Okay? So it is not a walk in the park. But I also want Kenyans to know that Kenya is a shareholder in IMF. And Kenya is also a shareholder in the bank. Okay, so these are institutions that we subscribe to. And so, so, it so, so, it is, so, so the whole issue of changing the economy means that if these institutions give you a red card, it will affect not just the government, but it will also affect the private sector of Kenya they will not be able to access their own credit lines in other countries. Right. So it is a very serious matter. But, but, but tell me this, because previously we had a debt ceiling of 10 trillion shillings um, that was to expire June 2024. Of course, we already burst that uh, as early as June this year. Then there is a new policy debt anchor of 55% of GDP. Again, we are too far away beyond that, that, that debt anchor. So we're getting the facilities from IMF and the World Bank regardless of the ceiling? You see, they, they look at policies. There are many policies that we have to look at. It's not just a one-off issue. There are so many things. Are we managing uh, the physical issues properly? Are we restricting public expenditure and all that? So all these accumulate into a program with the, 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 the IMF and, and uh, the World Bank. So all I can say at, at, at this point in time that it is going to be hard, but it is absolutely essential that we engage positively with these institutions. So for you, because you've been in that space, you would know, then why, why have ceilings? Why have the tankers? So that you don't overborrow. So that you live within your means. Okay. So there must be some regulation, some guidelines. So tell me, as we, as we conclude, there has recently there was something that came from different uh, government offices or departments. Case in point, the citizen services and the charges that are being increased. Isn't this a bit of insensitivity on the side of government? Yes, you want to raise revenue, but when does government stop? I think it was revoked. It was revoked and not introduced. It was revoked. With a lot of similarity. Uh, it was revoked. I think the ones that were extremely contentious were revoked. Uh, and uh, they were reviewed, or at least they're in the process of review. So it's, the truth is, it's, it's a bit difficult. Uh, all the things we do will not be popular. Uh, some will be painful at some stage. Uh, but 
by and large, uh, some, I want to say that uh, our resolve will yield results down the line. So you say two to three years, which you haven't heard. The president has spoken even a timeline. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about Musalia, and I told you I put it on record. Yeah. Uh, but he has said equally that it will take time, but there's hope. He says it's, it, it is hard, but there's hope. Prime Cabinet Secretary, we have to leave it at that point. But I have to thank you so much for making time for us to have this conversation about um, your role as PCS, as well as uh, the CS for Foreign and Diaspora Affairs, and of course your perspectives about the country that has been PCS. Musala Mudavadi speaking to us on this. Thank you.